How are y'all today? That was not the response. Yeah. Yoo-hoo! There we go. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just kind of want to brag on God a little bit before I jump into the sermon. Most of you know that Randy and I have um, Love Others Ministries, which is our mobile clothing closet. And we were able to go yesterday um, and be with Kingdom Life Community Church, which is Pastor Michael Trodden's church. And he invited us to come and set up, and they did hot dogs. Um, I don't know how many people they fed. We probably had around 20 or 25 people come through yesterday. And I was sitting there, and I was talking to his wife as well, and we were talking about this is what church is about. It's not about Kingdom Life Church. It's not about Cornerstone Church. It's not about the street, the church down the street. It's about us as a church as a whole. The church. That's exactly right. So, again, I want to thank him publicly. I did a Facebook page post yesterday, but so very thankful for that opportunity. And um, God is good. And he continues to bless us and with donations and um, be in prayer for a building. We're to the point we need a building. Um, God wants to grow our ministry, and we can't do it out of our house. (laughs) So we need a building. So just be in prayer for that. So anyway, let's jump into our sermon. Continuing today with our um, five-fold ministry series that Nathan started two weeks ago um, about our callings and how God has called each of us and has equipped us to live out our calling. So our our verse that we've been reading is in Ephesians 4, 11 through 13 that says, So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we are all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. So two weeks ago when we started the series, Pastor Nathan preached on the apostle gift. An apostle means sent one, a messenger that has been sent. Examples of that is a missionary or church planner. Then last week, he talked about the prophet gift. In the Old Testament, God would reveal things to the prophets, and they would speak on God's behalf. Prophets are the most God-oriented of all five of the callings. Modern-day prophets have a heart to see people live holy lives. And this week, we're going to be discussing evangelist. And that's what I scored the highest on was evangelist. And so this was very interesting to me, and I was excited to, to kind of look at it. I was like, okay, yeah, I check that, check that. I, I, I do all that so that it does fit me. Um, so this afternoon we are going to be doing our Zoom call like we have been doing. So all of you please plan to join us for our after-service Zoom call at 5 o'clock. We're going to be discussing how the evangelist function is within the church. Um, and today we're going to be talking about how the evangelist function is outside of the church. So what is an evangelist? The evangelist is a preacher of the gospel, a proclaimer of the good news of salvation in Jesus. They get the message out and get a positive response from the audience. They're persuasive, infectious people with appealing personalities. They're typically positive good news people. They have a great way of translating the gospel in ways that make sense. You might have heard of a couple of different evangelists. One very well-known is Billy Graham. He's always been one of my, my favorites. American evangelist, prominent um, evangelical, evangelical, can't talk, evangelical Christian figure, became well known internationally in the late 1940s. One of his biographers had placed him among the most influential Christian leaders of the 20th century. Another example of evangelist is Dwight L. Moody. He was an American evangelist who founded the Moody Church. Northfield School, Mount Hermon School in Massachusetts, Moody Bible Institute, Moody Publishers, and literary works published by the Moody Bible Institute claimed that he was the greatest evangelist of the 19th century. But there's a couple of people that you don't think about as evangelists that were found in the Bible. One of those was the woman at the well. In John 4, Jesus goes to this well And he talks to the Samaritan woman. You've heard this story before. He talks to the Samaritan woman, wants her to to give him a drink of water. And for her part, drawing water was a routine, ordinary task. Although she was there in the hottest part of the day because there was nobody else there. Anyway, it it was her daily routine. She unexpectedly encountered God. At the well, conversation ensues. She discovers that Jesus claims to be the Messiah knows everything about her, and is offering her life eternal. 
So what happens after this, after she has this conversation, this life-changing conversation with Jesus, as she runs back into town, she's overjoyed by this encounter with Jesus, that she leaves her water jug, not even giving it a second thought, and she had more important things in her mind. Once she was in town, she became the evangelist. She was bursting with good news of Jesus. She told her neighbors, you know, about what happened and, and invited them. Come see this man who told me everything I did. Come see the Messiah. Many of her neighbors responded to that invitation. They believed in Jesus because of her testimony and spent time with him. They told her, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves and we know that this man really is the Savior of the world. And another example in the Bible that you might not think of as an evangelist was Mary Magdalene. After Jesus' crucifixion, you know, she went with these other women to, to prepare his body with spices. Um, and they go to the tomb, and he's not there. So she's standing there looking, and she's crying because she's like, where, where did he go? Did somebody steal him? And then all of a sudden, she hears her name, and she turns around, and there he is. He's standing there in front of her. And what does, she, what does he want her to do? He wants her to go back and tell my brothers, tell them that I'm alive, that I'm not dead. So she, of course, I'm sure is awestruck. I probably would have passed out. I don't know what I would have done, but I'm sure she's awestruck. She runs with joy to share the good news with the disciples. I have seen the Lord, she tells them. In that moment, Mary Magdalene became an evangelist to the disciples who were some of her closest friends. Jesus was also an evangelist. You know, Jesus is all five of these things that we're, we're going through, but he was also an evangelist. We're not familiar, or we, we don't hear him being called that, but he, we portray him as an evangelist, highlighting his work and announcing and demonstrating the good news, and he, you know, he traveled from town to town like an evangelist typically does. But today we're going to be talking about Philip. He is um, in Acts chapter 8 is where we're going to be stationed at most of the time. Um, but Philip the Evangelist, there were two Philips in the Bible, but we're going to be talking about Philip the Evangelist. He's actually the only one in the Bible that's called an evangelist. Now, although there were many, but there was not, they were not specifically called out as one. So we first hear about him in Acts chapter 6. We're going to read verses six, chapter 6, verses 3 through 5, and it says, Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them, and we will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, also Philip, Prochorius, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenius, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. So the disciples chose these seven men to send out to spread the word. And like I said, we're going to be talking about Philip today. I'm going to be going along how Nathan has been doing it for the last couple of weeks with five terms that kind of tell you what an evangelist is. So the first term is proclaimer. Proclaimer. So a proclaimer is to make known openly or publicly. So in Acts chapter 8, we're going to read about Philip again. Because of the great persecution amongst the church in Jerusalem, everyone had scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. So we're going to start reading in verses Four, we're going to read verses 4 through 8 first. It says, Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, they all paid close attention to what he said. For with shrieks, impure spirits came out of many, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was great joy in the city. So in those verses, we see Philip proclaimed the Messiah in Samaria and started performing miracles as well. An evangelist proclaims the core message of the church. They openly and publicly speak about God. So now we're going to continue reading. We're going to go through 9 through 13. Now for some time, a man named Simon had practiced sorcery in the city and amazed all the people of Samaria. He boasted that he was someone great, and all the people, both high and low, gave him their attention and exclaimed, This man is rightly called the great power of God. They followed him because he had amazed them for a long time with his sorcery. But when they believed Philip, as he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. 
Simon himself believed and was baptized, and he followed Philip everywhere, astonished by the great signs and miracles he saw. So as you can see here, this man who was practicing sorcery, who had a following of his own, Philip went in and started proclaiming the good news to these people, and it changed their life. And they started following Philip and believing what he was saying about the kingdom of God, and they were baptized. And then Simon the sorcerer, even himself, changed his ways and, were baptized, and was baptized. There are a few verses in the Bible that tell us to proclaim. Isaiah 12, 4, give praise to the Lord, proclaim his name, make known among the nations what he has done, and proclaim that his name is exalted. Luke 4, 18 through 19 tells us, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the favor, the year of the Lord's favor. And that Luke chapter 4, 18 through 19 can, can apply to us as well. You know, we, we are called to go and proclaim the good news to the poor. We're sent out to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, not just the prisoners in jail. I'm talking about the prisoners who have chains of sin. And we are to help the oppressed and proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. We need to tell people, proclaim our goodness. You know, he, he's done so much for us. Are you telling people that? Or you got your blinders on and you're going through life in your tunnel vision. You've, you guys have heard me talk about tunnel vision a lot. But I talk about that because we do. We get so sidetracked. But are you proclaiming the Lord? Are you proclaiming those good things, those favor that he has given to you? That's our job. Even if you didn't score high in evangelist, that's still our job to do that. So without someone proclaiming the gospel, people would never know about it. People would never hear about it. We see this in countries where people had never been preached the gospel. And that's hard for us to understand. We have a church on every corner. We grew up in church. We've, we've heard about God. But there are actually countries in this world that have never heard of God. Never even, they don't even know what you're talking about. And so, you know, that's, we're supposed to go to every ends of the earth and proclaim that. So that is our job to get out and tell people. Romans 10, 14 tells us, But how are they to call on one in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in one of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone to proclaim him? So if you don't go out of your comfort zone and, and go and talk to people and proclaim, how are they ever going to hear it? We're all called to do that, and an evangelist definitely does just that. So your second term for an evangelist is missioner, missioner, which is a person who's sent to do religious work, similar to missionary, um, but missioner. People did, P Philip did just that in Acts 8, 5. It says he went down to the city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. In verse 26, the Lord told Philip to go south, down from Jerusalem to Gaza, and in verse 40, he says that Philip traveled and preached in all towns until he reached this area. When you think of a modern-day evangelist, I always think of someone who is on a mission traveling from town to town telling others about God. Billy Graham, what did he do? He traveled to all these countries and stadiums and, and all that kind of stuff, but he, he was traveled around to where the people were, which we talk so much about here about doing outreach. We have to go to where the people are. So that's just their missioners, they, the evangelists, they go out town to town telling people. So that's also our part. According to Matthew 28, 19 through 20, it says, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So Matthew 28, he's telling us all to go and make disciples, not just the evangelist, not just the apostle, not just the prophet. He's telling all of us to do that. Many churches have forgotten that part of the mission. While the apostles remind us that we're sent and the prophets remind us that we should love others, evangelists lead the way by mainly focusing on those that are our mission, which is outside the four walls of the church. They keep our focus outward. Unfortunately, most churches have become very inward focused. They want to keep their people comfortable inside the four walls. They've forgotten that it's, our mission is to reach the people outside the four walls. 
And I, it's so sad to think about that in the church today that people come in and sit and they think, okay, I've gone to church on Sunday, check. And they don't think about church again till the next Sunday at 10 30 as they're trying to run out the door to get here at 10 45. So, you know, we, we've got to remember that church is a 24 7, how can I put it? Something that we, we need to be 24 7. We don't just need to be while we're here. And it needs to be outward focused, and we need to be out in those communities, and we need to be helping others. Because if we're not doing it, who's going to? What are the people in the world hearing on social media? They're not hearing about God. So we have to be that light, and we have to be outward focused. We have to get outside the doors and tell people. And get out, Again, I mentioned this earlier, but your comfort zones. We all have a comfort zone, and so we've got to get out of those comfort zones. So evangelists are vital in keeping the church outward focused. So your next term is interpreter, which means to make plain or understandable. So in Acts 8, 26 through 35, we're going to read about Philip and how he interpreted. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch an important official in charge of all the treasury of the Kadaka, which means queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship and on his way home was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran into the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you are reading? Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. This is the passage of scripture the eunuch was reading. It was led like sheep humiliation. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before his shear is silent. So he did not open his mouth, and in his humiliation he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, Tell me, please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. So Philip helps the eunuch understand what the passage of scripture meant. He interpreted the scripture and told him about Jesus. And that is our job. As Christian believers, we're supposed to be in the word and understand the word and help those who are not understand it. There's a lot in there that I still don't understand. But we have other people that we can go to that will help us. So an evangelist is an interpreter. When they go out and they're speaking to people, they are there to kind of break it down and to help us understand the word better. Many people feel like pastors and teachers teach over their head. They're saying something, but people do not understand what's being said. And evangelists make sure that the core message is being communicated in such a way that people understand just as Jesus did when he told parables to the people. He told them in such a way they could understand. And I was thinking of some of his parables that he told, but you did mustard seed. That's something they could relate to, something very small. Have faith of, of a mustard seed. Um, you know, he, but he, he would talk about things that was going on during that time period so they could understand it. And that's what an evangelist does. They take something that's going on and they explain it in a way that you can understand it better. Jesus interpreted the Bible so even the most common person could understand. It can be complicated. I totally understand the Bible can be complicated, but that's why we have people to help us understand it. Your next term for evangelist is motivator. One that motivates or impels someone or something. So in Acts 8, we read about Simon the sorcerer. We talked about him and how he followed um, Philip, um, and got, he got saved and baptized. And it says, But when they believed Philip as he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus, they were baptized, both men and women. Simon himself believed and was baptized, and he followed Philip everywhere, astonished by the great signs and miracles that he saw. So Philip had motivated them to change their ways and believe, and, and believe in Jesus Christ. And that's what we have to do. We have to live our life in such a way that people want to know, why are you different? You know, if you're going through something hard and you kind of sail right through it, or you, you're talking to them about it and you're being very open, you want 
people to say, what is different? Why, you know, that would cripple me, you know. If, and so we have to, we have to understand that um, we are sometimes the only Bible that people see. And so we just have to remember that. And so Philip motivated them to change their ways and believe in Jesus. They were baptized, and even Simon changed his ways and was baptized, even to the point that he followed Philip around. Some don't believe they are sinful and they don't need to change. They're not motivated to change or accept Jesus as their Savior. An evangelist connects well with them and can help motivate them to change their life and start living for God. And for me, I always think the more relatable you can be with people, the more they're going to be motivated to change. If I've gone through something and I tell you about it, you might be going through the same thing. Or you might at some point go through the same thing. And so I, for me, I think the more relatable you can be, the better. And that will help motivate people. Because a lot of times when people see a speaker, they're like, oh, they're up here. They're better than me. No. No, we're not. <laughs> We go through all that same stuff that everybody else goes through. And so the more relatable that I can be, the more relatable you can be to people, the more it's going to motivate them to want to change their life and to, to be a, um, a Christian. So the next term is messenger. A person who, to com who conveys a message by direct communication. So Philip traveled from place to pra place preaching to others about the good news. He carried the message of good news to towns and cities. And as we read in verses 12 through 13, people believed what Philip said and in the name of Jesus were baptized. He carried the message of hope to many people in Samaria and carried the message to an eunuch on a desert road. So being a messenger does not mean standing up here and speaking in front of a group of people all the time. Being a messenger could be that one person on that dirt road that you find or that one person in the store. I can't tell you how many times I've been in Walmart and Randy gets missing and I don't know where he's at and I will see him talking to somebody on an aisle. So it, it, there's no certain place you're going to meet somebody. It could be that one person or it could be a group of 10 people. It could be a group of 100 people. But you have to remember you're always a messenger wherever you go and you just have to be prepared and be ready. And watch how you're living your life. Because that may be your only message to people is how you're living your life. We're all carriers of the message. Unfortunately, many people keep their message covered up. I love that. Because it's so true. We're all carriers of the message. Unfortunately, many people keep their message covered up. It goes back to that. You come on Sundays and when you go out the door, you don't think about it again. Don't keep your message covered up. Share your message with people. You are a Christian 24-7, or you should be. So you need to share your message with people. Evangelists make sure the message is being carried with them wherever they go. We need them to remind us to always carry the message with us. So did you resonate with any of those terms? Are you a proclaimer? Are you a missioner? Are you an interpreter, a motivator, and a messenger? Can you relate to being an evangelist? Do you feel that God has gifted you in that area? I want to read you a story. It's about a guy named Joseph. He was a Messiah um, warrior, which is um, an ethnic group in Africa. And he attended an evangelistic conference in Amsterdam where he met Billy Graham. And that's when this story was told. So I want to read this story about Joseph. One day, Joseph, who was walking along one of those hot, dirty African roads, met someone who shared the gospel of Jesus Christ with him. Then and there, he accepted Jesus as his Lord and Savior. The power of the Spirit began transforming his life. He was filled with such excitement and joy that the first thing he wanted to do was return to his own village and share the same good news with the members of his local tribe. Joseph began going door to door, telling everyone he met about Jesus and a salvation that he offered, expecting to see their faces light up the way his had, but to his amazement, the villagers not only didn't care, they became violent. The men of the village seized him and held him to the ground while the women beat him with strands of barbed wire. He was dragged to the village and left to die alone in the bush. 
Joseph somehow managed to crawl to a water hole and there, after days of passing in and out of consciousness, found the strength to get up. He wondered about the hostile reception he had received from the people he had known all of his life. He decided he must have left something out or told the story of Jesus incorrectly. After rehearsing the message he had first heard, he decided to go back and share his faith once more. Joseph limped into the circle of huts and began to proclaim Jesus. He died for you so that you might find forgiveness and come to know the living God, he pleaded. Again, he was grabbed by the men of the village and held while the women beat him, reopening wounds that had just begun to heal. Once more, they dragged him unconscious from the village and left him to die. To survive the first beating was truly remarkable. To live through the second was a miracle. Again, days later, Joseph awoke in the wilderness, bruised, scarred, and determined to go back. He returned to the small village, and this time they attacked him before he had a chance to open his mouth. As they flogged him for the third and probably the last time, he began to speak to them of Jesus, the Lord. Before he passed out, the last thing he saw was that a woman who was beating him began to weep. This time he awoke in his own bed. The ones who had so severely beaten him were now trying to save his life and nurse him back to health. The entire village had come to Christ. Joseph was saved when he met someone on a dirt road who shared the gospel with him. We don't need a prior relationship to share the gospel. We only need humble faith and genuine love. Everyone we meet needs the gospel, so share it with them. Joseph shows us that when we see Christ as our only satisfying treasure and how lost people are without him, we will not let anything stop us from sharing the good news. Joseph's suffering was part of his message as it displayed how precious Christ was to him. So don't fear rejection, scoffing, or worse. God will give you grace to suffer, and he could use your suffering to save your whole office, neighborhood, family, town. So if you feel that you are gifted in this area of being an evangelist, the world needs you, period. The world needs more evangelists because we have been given a mission, and that's to make disciples. Don't be scared to answer your call. Look at the example of Joseph. You know, he was beat. They thought he was going to die. He got back up and went back in there again. And, you know, we live in America where, as of right now, we have that freedom that we can talk about it, our religious beliefs, for right now. So you need to do it. You need to be out there, and you need to share your message. If you have been called, don't be scared. I was scared to answer my call. I've, I have family who, who doesn't agree with me being a pastor. I've never been beat. And I, 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 as I read that story, I was like, how would I react to that? Would I have gone back to my village and done it again? Are you willing to do that? Because at some point in America, we might get to that. So God will equip you and empower you. God will place you in the right place at the right time to share the gospel with those who need it. So if you feel like this is what you've been called to do, please let us know. We want to help equip you. We want to help guide you. Um, we, we need people that are willing to go out of the four doors and share the message. If you will stand, we will have a word of prayer.